complexity. So there's all these added layers of technology coming into the network, resulting in a lot more nodes in the network. Like in, in GSM, traditionally we had BSCs and MSCs. Now we've got SGSNs, GGSNs, call servers, media gateways, and so on. So this proliferation in nodes makes the, diff the uh, network a lot more difficult to engineer than it has been traditionally, right? And, and, and I think we've taken an approach, you know, that humans process visual information much better than they do uh, verbal information. So one of the key things that we do when we look at how to simplify the engineering of the network with, again, these multiple layers, uh, uh, a 2.5G a, a layer with a 3 and a half, uh, with a three, uh, three g layer, what happens is we, we use maps and ge geo-information, basically. We geocode information on, on, on uh, a map-based uh, view, and then we, we add, we go in and add all the statistics about the network to understand how the interplay between the technology works, right? And from that information, what we do is we go and analyze and do a proactive what-ifs on the network. One of the biggest things we've been seeing when, we do our, when we're doing our work in North America and, and other markets is the fact that the overlay now, the problem with the overlay is now you have the interaction between the two different radio technologies, for example, between 3G and 2.5G. And how does that affect all the no core network elements, right? The fact we're seeing is that there is a tax that needs to be understood on all the different control planes within the network. And we need to fully understand the implication of that so we don't go out and roll out a very thin layer of 3G, but we, we actually roll out a sufficiently uh, capacity sufficient layer for 3G that we can, can address the demand of both the 3G services we're trying to deliver, but also the underlying 2G tax when we transition between the two because of the fact that right. there is not continuity in 3G coverage, for example, every year. Right, years. right. So the, the whole engineering process is a lot more complex than it used to be. So the traditional approach used by engineers to design and plan their networks has been very much spreadsheet-based, right? right? And uh, really ad hoc spreadsheet methods that have resulted in, you know, different engineers coming up with different answers based on their own uh, processes for analysing the... Uh, impact of demand and mobility on the network. So what you're saying really is they need far more sophisticated capability to do this. Yes. And a, a visual method based on maps yeah. is really a, a very powerful way of then interpreting all this complex data. Exactly. Right? GIS, so you know, geographical view, uh, extensive data mining with the predictive capability that we have, which is what if. What if I, re I change the network configuration? How does that really impact the loading on my uh, core network elements? And how do I ensure that I have sufficient capacity on those core elements to support the future traffic growth that I'm projecting? So that's an important point you make there. I, you know, my view is traditionally uh, operators haven't leveraged the data available in their network to proactively plan their networks to a, a large degree. Right? I mean, that, yes, they've used the data, but on a kind of limited basis. So what you're really saying is to address this complexity, they need to leverage this data more, dive deeper to get more detail in order to proactively get a better view of where they're heading. Is that right? Absolutely. What I'm saying is I think that we have the ability um, to be a little bit smarter about how you engineer the network in terms of uh, taking into account the statistics, for example. Uh, a lot of the behavior patterns, mobility behavior patterns of the customers will not change with their, with their upgrade to the 3G device. So there is significant st traffic statistics out there, for example, in your 2.5G networks to go and, and predict where the use of 3G is going to be and proactively anticipate capacity requirements for that. Yeah, so that's great. We can add, so we can leverage historic data from 2G, 2.5G networks to better understand proactively how three and four G networks are going to perform, and, and and the bottom line, how does this help the end customer? Is in terms of the network core network engineers, is we help avoid cost. You know, in terms of uh, emergency uh, uh, injection of additional capacity to the network, everything uh, in a core network t requires time to get the infrastructure in, and when you start to accelerate that timeline, the cost of installing and uh, commissioning uh, go skyrocket. Right, and being proactive, of course, rather than reactive, means the, the chances of rework are that much lower because you've really got a course that you've set for the evolution of your network. Rather than reacting to emergencies, 
jumpy and potentially having to come back and change things later, which again, to your point, has a, yeah. has a high cost. Yeah, and, and this kind of, I, what I think is this wait and see kind of attitude, let's see what happens. Um, again, like, as you say, it, it increases the cost of redesigning and reconfiguring the network. And one of the things I know as a network operator, and I know that you, Peter, have been run operated networks in the, uh, the European markets is, is that you don't want to change or touch your network because there's a potential for right, right. disruptions, right? And yeah, absolutely. Uh, operators want to keep the, you know, the disruption to a network to an absolute minimum. So as part of the design and planning process, it's important to proactively look at the evolution of the network with a focus on uh, minimizing the disruption to the network, particularly in terms of uh, like rehomes or reparenting, right? Where um, if, it, if done in a reactive mode, uh, rehoming can explode. But if it's planned properly, it can be minimized and therefore disruption to the network is minimized. One of the things that we've been doing as working with the service providers across the country and across the world is looking at how do we make uh, the engineering process is more accurate, more efficient, and one of the things we've been able to do is is introduce this uh, GIS-based, map view-based analysis where we have concurrent engineers come into the room, look at the design, and everybody certifies that that design is correct. We now then flow that information directly into um, uh, capability to actually import in, into OSS systems and actually make, uh, make actionable items in terms of rehome. So one of the things we're trying to do is avoid, as you change your network, mistakes in parameter settings. Right. So th th this is really about end-to-end -end automation of the design and planning yeah. process, right, at a very granular level, and then feeding that through into the implementation phase, right. So, the sc so by automating this, uh, you can speed up the process, right? So the sort of time to market for new designs is that much faster. With automation, you can uh, examine what ifs very yeah. quickly, and you can, uh, as an output, you can minimise the amount of network disruption uh, by evaluating all the alternatives and coming up with the best possible solution. And what we found, Peter, exactly, is that we've been able to predict within 10 to 15 percent how the network's going to behave after the implementation. So there's no need to go and implement and see what happens. We actually have an understanding fundamentally of how that network will behave afterwards. So we can look and evaluate hundreds and hundreds of different scenarios for the customer and find the most, not only the most cost effective, but the most uh, efficient from a performance perspective results. And, and we've proven this, right? Yeah. We've, got, we've actually uh, made some predictions of where we're going to be and then we've gone back and benchmarked. What, uh, what sort of percentage have we been? We've been, within? Within, we've been typically with under 10% in terms of how the network behaves after the fact. We've seen um, the actual um, utilization of, our, uh, of uh, components increase by 10 to 15% on average. We've seen uh, actual on the borders using our border performance optimization, the actual drop call rate reduced by up to 10% in, in areas where we've been uh, optimized. Um, not only that, we've uh, gotten a tremendous feedback from our customers in terms of the process of before and after when Syrian has come in and used our platform and software to actually redesign the networks. Calling it, for example, one customer called it uh, flawless in terms of the execution of uh, integration of two major networks together. So this is great. This is, this is really leveraging data to be more proactive and getting proven mm -hmm. uh, results uh, based on a, on a forecast, right, to within 10%, which is not something people have done traditionally, yeah. right. I, I think where we're going is taking, like you said before, Peter, that spreadsheet, so those Excel spreadsheets that a lot of the core network engineers have been using, and not only the core network engineers, but the, the folks that are on the RAND side that are designing the BSEs and RNCs, and taking that and developing a very sophisticated GIS view, map-based view, where we can do predictive what-ifs and come up with recommendations with concurrent engineers coming together very quickly and uh, actually implement uh, new uh, network designs. So.